Good morning. Well, I feel pretty much all the way better now, except uh, I got a nagging cough that won't go away, so I still got my water bottle with me and cough drop in my mouth, and hopefully uh, just continue to pray that my voice uh, lasts through the sermon and that hopefully this little nagging cough will go away. I've heard from quite a few people that it's lasted for them when they had it for anywhere from four weeks to a few months, so uh, let's hope it's the four weeks mark, because I'm about at that right now, and uh, so hopefully that'll be over with. Go ahead and put on the screen again the upcoming weeks of the uh, reading, so that way if you want to know what you read, if you weren't here last week or the week before, you can kind of see where we're going with it, so that way you kind of know where to uh, read before you come, and so you're kind of up to date, because as I've said before, there is so much that we could talk about in all of these different weeks. And it is just, to be honest, impossible to get to it all. Uh, But I know the Holy Spirit can work through your reading and uh, touch your hearts with things that I maybe didn't cover on Sunday morning, but that will be impactful for you in your reading of Scripture. And so I hope that you'll continue to read along with us. You might have heard this quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that said, it's not the destination... It's the journey. Now, many of you have probably heard that quote before. And overall, it's not a bad quote because sometimes we get too fixated on the end goal that we forget how to get there. But it's also not really 100% accurate either because it is about the destination. It's not just the journey. And so when we read today's text, we see that. That it's actually both. It's not one or the other. It's not that one is more important than the other. Well, in fact, it is that one's more important than the other. Sorry, I misspoke. It's, not, it's actually the destination that's more important, but the journey still matters. And so that's the thing that we're going to learn today. And so if you have your Bibles with you, turn to John chapter 14. We're going to spend about half of our text there in John chapter 14. And so if you just want to keep your Bibles there, you can. And I'll also have the scriptures up on the screen behind me. And in John 14, we're going to read verse 6, which Karen already read this morning, um, and I'm sure you've heard many times before, but I would like to read it again right now. And John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we look at this text, we notice something that's kind of glaring. It's a little tiny word that really makes everything different. And it's the word, the. He is not a way, a truth, and a life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this little definite article, this little tiny word, changes the meaning of the entire thing. It's not just a way, it's the way. And I kind of want to break down each one of these words of uh, way, truth, and life for you. But what I want to do is actually go in reverse order here. Because as I said, the most important thing is the destination. And that's the first thing. Jesus is the life. Now, it's easy whenever we first read life, we think of biological life. We think of that we're living right now, that we have Life, this physical world that we are on, is life. There are living creatures all around us. But this isn't what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about something more, something deeper. He's talking about something supernatural, something eternal. That's what he means by life. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this life. I just want to hit it kind of briefly because if you remember two weeks ago, we've been going through different things that Jesus has said. And he said that I am the resurrection and the life. And so we kind of already addressed this topic of life. But I do want to kind of briefly mention it again here because it is important to the rest of the text. Because this is the end goal. This is what we're striving for. The eternal life. And you see, Jesus has power over life and death. And we know this because he died on the cross and the death did not hold him, but he rose from the dead on the third day and he defeated death. He has power over life and death. We see this in the story of Lazarus. What did Jesus do? He allows Lazarus to die. He's not in a hurry to get there because he knows that there's a teaching moment there. 
And he knows that he has the power to bring Lazarus back because he has power over life and death. And you see, it's only through Jesus that we can have this eternal life. It is only through Jesus that we can have it. In fact, that's what he's talking about with the woman on the well when he's talking about how we have this living water where you'll never be thirsty again. He's talking about eternal life. That's what he's talking about. Over and over again, he's making these uh, allusions to the eternal life that only you can have through him. And this eternal life is also, uh, we see it in that it says coming to the Father. The only way to go to the Father is through Jesus. That is the eternal life, going to the Father, where our end goal is to be with God in heaven forever. And so that's how we know that Jesus has power over life. He is the only way to that. It is the destination, the goal, what we are all striving for. It's the question that was on the rich young ruler's mind. It was the question that's on many of the people's mind, like in Corinthians when they're asking about resurrection and Paul has to correct them on what resurrection is. They want to know what is the destination, what is eternal life. And it's the same thing we're striving for now because we know that we, or at least we have the hope and we know that because of our faith in Jesus Christ that this life is not all that there is. That there's something beyond this and that is what we're striving for because this life isn't that great. Now you may be content in this life and it's, you're happy to be here, but th- there's tons of sorrow and misery and pain and suffering on this life that let's face it, all of us would be happy to discard and leave on the side. One day we will get to do that. And that's the destination. That's what our eyes are fixated on. Whenever Paul says, keep your eyes on things above, not on earthly things, that's the destination, the things above. Whenever James says, you can have joy in trials. Why? Because blessed is those who persevere, because theirs is the crown of life. It's all about the destination. That is what we're striving for. But then there's these other two things too. So we're going to go in reverse order here. And the second one is that Jesus is the truth. Now, the word for truth here is connected specifically in the Old Testament to faithfulness and very specifically to basically faithful testimony or a reliable testimony. So it's basically kind of the opposite of false witness. And so the opposite of false witness is this word for truth. And so basically what he's saying is that the, the testimony, the reliable testimony that you can depend on is Jesus Christ. He is the truth that we can rely on. And he is the most and only testimony that we should put our faith into. And this means that he speaks and teaches truth. And so we can rely on his words. And whenever he speaks, we listen. Those who have ears, let them hear. Why? Because he is truth. And we can base our life on that. But it's more than this, though. It isn't a truth, but the truth. It's important to note that. You see, Jesus is the truth of, or Jesus is the truth that fulfills all of God's truth. This means that he fulfills Scripture. And all of Scripture points to Jesus. In fact, the disciples understood this because often whenever they were quoting Old Testament scriptures, they saw Old Testament scriptures in a different light than the Jews of the day did. Why? Because all of a sudden they knew about Jesus. And Jesus reinterpreted, re- allowed them to re-understand exactly what scripture was talking about because they knew the truth. So that means all the other truths had to fall in line with him or they weren't truth. And so that meant that the Old Testament had to be reinterpreted through the lens of Jesus. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, I did, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
He is the combination of the Old Testament, of the law and the prophets. If you want to see what the law and prophets was supposed to be and it was meant to be, then you look at Jesus. He is the law and the prophets. He has fulfilled what they speak of. And then in John 14, just a little later in the text, Jesus himself has this to say, where he says in verse 39, and then jumping over to verse, or not John 14, sorry, John 5, my apologies. John 5, Jesus has this to say in verse 39, and then uh, again in 46, where he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. There's that destination again. And it is they that bear witness about me. And then jumping down to 46, he says, For if you believed Moses, which the Jews they're speaking to, they all believe Moses. There's no doubt about that. He says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. And so we only understand truth in light of Jesus. That is the only way that we can even begin to fathom what truth is, is to know who Jesus is. Because he is the truth. You see, all the Old Testament points to Jesus, the Gospels are about Jesus, and the New Testament and the age of the church point back to Jesus. It's all about him. And so that means that any truth that we have on this earth is now interpreted in light of of Jesus. And if it doesn't mess with Jesus, then it's not truth. Because he is the truth. And this tells us how we get to the destination. This tells us how we can begin to understand how to get to eternal life. Is by relying on the truth and knowing that it is through Jesus that we get there. And so we have to depend on him and take our understanding from him and make sure that we're listening to his words and all the things that were written about him, meaning the Old Testament and the epistles. And so then we start thinking about our lives in light of that. And it leads us to the final thing. Jesus is the way. Or maybe we could put it a slightly different way. Jesus is the journey. Now this word could mean just your thoroughfare for travel, like a road or a path or a highway, but it was also used in a different way. It could mean the journey or specifically the way of life. The way you lived your life is what this word meant there when it says the way. In fact, it was such commonplace in... Uh, in the New Testament and in the New Testament age that really one of the first terms for Christians was followers of the way. That's what they called them. They weren't known as the church. They weren't known really as Christians or even really as disciples always yet. It was followers of the way. That's what we see first in Acts whenever they're starting to refer to themselves because Jesus is the way. And we can see that it's a way of life by, again, in the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he uses the same Greek word here. And you've probably heard this little uh, saying before. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Again, that concept of life. And those who find it are few. That way, that way of life, the way we live, is what he's talking about here. See, by saying that Jesus is the way, he is not saying that he is the better way. He is saying he is the only way. You see, there's this belief that's coming, becoming more and more common that the important thing is just to believe in something. It's not what you believe, but just that you believe. 
And you've probably seen this in movies or TV shows or even in pop culture or sometimes even in editorials in the paper where people are knocking people that have tried to say that Christianity is the only way and they start talking about how it's just important to believe because ultimately they think that belief that all, all ways, all roads lead to the same place, lead to the same destination. And they're basically saying that the journey doesn't matter. It's just about the destination. And this is where there is some, some truth in what Ralph, Wal, Ralph Waldo Emerson is saying. But the problem is he kind of almost puts too much stock in the journey. But the journey does matter. It's just not the most important thing. But how you get there matters. Because there isn't multiple ways. There is only one way. And so that means that no matter what road you have, no matter how good you try to live your life, no matter how devout you are in your belief, if it's not in Jesus, you fall short. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He leaves no wiggle room. This is why those definite articles matter. It's why the the is so important. Because he doesn't leave any room for error or misunderstanding. He is the way. And it is the only way to the Father is by following him. And it's why in John 14, a few verses later, when he says this, it has a, a, such a good meaning and deeper understanding of it. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's saying, if you want to follow me, if you love me, you will do what I say. You will make the way of your life what I tell you to do. And it's important to note that he does include the word love me because he's not wanting just like going through the motions like you have to do it. He's wanting you to want to do it. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. If you love me, you will live the way. You will follow the way of life that I have set forth to you. This is the journey that we all take. Now, our journeys will be different. We will falter along the way. Some people's journeys are longer than others. But what matters is, did you take the journey? You may have taken it way later in life, but you eventually realized the error of your way and followed the way. You may have started from birth when you were raised in the church and from the very get-go, you were taught to follow the way. Whatever it may be, that's not important. The important thing is that you took the way, the only way to eternal life. The life we're all striving for. But this then brings the question of what about those that don't know the way? I've said it many times, but Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And so if our focus is the destination, don't we want everyone else to be to that destination too? Amen. And it means that they need to know the way. It's not enough that they're a good person. Hell is paved with good intentions. You've heard that say before, said before. I've known many good people that never knew Jesus. And even though it pains me to say it, they didn't end at the final destination that we want, that we want them to end at. In fact, my own uh, mother's father was never there. Good man, taught my mom good morals. In fact, everyone in my, my mom's sisters have good morals, more morals than a lot of people around them. But he didn't know the way and unfortunately that meant that he wasn't following Jesus who is the only way and so if there's someone in your life who doesn't know the way then I hope that you love them enough to show them the way take them along with you and follow with them as you're leading them down the journey, the path of life where they can follow Jesus so they know the truth 
about what we really should be believing and what we put our faith into so that way they know the life that they'll eventually have, an eternal life in Jesus Christ where we get to spend eternity with God the Father. And that is our mission here on this earth. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you are the way. And that you've given us your truth that we may understand what the way is, Lord. God, you are great. And we thank you so much that you've given us the ability to have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.